titled Darkness, which is chapter 13. Um, right after Call dies. And they're making their way to the mountains because they're going to try, very shortly, to cut off the cauldron born from their passage to Inuvin. Remember, their, um, Terran and his group's task is to merely slow down the cauldron born so that Gwydion and his um, forces can get to the harbor, get the ships of dawn, and sneak up essentially behind um, Inuvin. So, page... Page 146. Taryn and the others are talking. Several days go by. And right in the middle of the page, we're told, Taryn frowned and shook his head grimly. I understand it all too well. Okay? The it that he understands all too well is what's referred to in the previous paragraph at the very end. At first, the cauldron born had chosen to disregard the ragged band. Now the deathless marchers not only quickened their pace, they swung closer to Terran's riders as though eager to join battle. So Terran says, I understand why. Their power had waned when they were farther from Anubin. Closer, it returns to them. Not because, you know, they're going to get rejuvenated because of the cauldron, because the cauldron's already gone. But what he's saying is their source of power is ultimately what? It's not the cauldron anymore. It's Iran. Where is Iran? He's at Anubin. So the farther they get away from him, the weaker they become. The closer they get back to him, the stronger they become. So the closer they get back to Anubin, the more and more willing the cauldron born or, or uh, the more and more they are willing to attack the stragglers from Terran's band and such. So he says, closer it returns to them, and as we grow weaker, they grow stronger. Unless we halt them, one time for all, that is, unless we fully, completely stop them, our efforts will do more than sap our own strength. We'll just keep dying, they'll just keep getting stronger. Soon we shall defeat ourselves more sharply than Iran's warriors could ever hope to do. Okay? They keep going on. Page 147, we realize Ilanwe and Gurgi are missing. Bottom of that page, we're told, of the combat warriors, one out of three had fallen beneath the swords of the deathless foe. So now, Terran's force is one-third the strength, or excuse me, it's two-thirds the strength it was when they left the comets. One-third of their entire forces have been wiped out. Okay? So, 148, 49, Terran realizes, he realized previously, the previous page, Ilan Wayne Gurgi are missing, and he's thinking, what should I do? He says to Fluter, what then? Would you have me leave Ilan Wayne and Gurgi in danger? Because what does he want to do? He wants to follow his heart. His heart says, rescue the woman he wants to marry. Fluter, it's a heavy choice, meaning you're the only one who can make it. Question here? No. Okay. He says, none can lighten it for you. Why can none lighten it? Remember what I think it was Lasser said um, after Terran had his first real experience of loss? After they go to Comet Marin and he finds Anlaw dead? He says, you know, an individual suffers his own hurts, his own faults or failings. But a leader of men suffers what? <laughs> He suffers the collective hurts. He suffers when they all suffer. Now, Terran's suffering is kind of split in two. He wants to go after where his heart says to go. His mind says, if I don't follow through with what I promised Gwydion, what? Not only my heart will lose, Iran wait, everybody's hearts will lose. Because Iran will ultimately win. Okay? And we're told at the bottom of that page, 
There is no common warrior who had not lost kinsmen or comrade. If he left them to seek Ailanwi, would she herself deem his choice good? Now, it's a rhetorical question. I think Terran knows. Ailanwi would say, fool, don't come after me. Stay with your people. So, he says, if they are slain, they are beyond my help. If they're already dead, I can't do any good for them. If they live, i got to hope they stay alive. Okay? So, they go off. They meet up with Dolly. Dolly says, Idalig has sent all the fair folk out to help stop um, Iran. 153, Dolly mentions some caverns that they're coming up to and says, we can go through the caverns and it's a shortcut. Okay? Shortcuts invariably turn out to be what? Just the opposite. Long cuts. They turn out to not work the way they are supposed to work. Okay? They go through... And what do we discover in these caverns? What are in the caverns? Gems. <clears throat> Lots of them. And who wants them? Glue. He pulls, seemingly, one gem out of a wall. And what does it do? Remember before Call died, what did he say to Terran? He said, one pebble can stop an avalanche. One twig can stop a tide. Well, similarly, one pebble pulled out of the right spot can start an avalanche. Okay? So, there's a cave in. We're going to skip a bunch. Go on to chapter 14. So they're blocked in. They've got to come back out the way they came. And Ilanwi sees them go into the cavern. Okay. But just before then, she gets captured by Dorath and his gang. Pages 163 and following. She calls uh, Dorath's men, try to, get, try to take her bauble from her and such. Dorath kind of reproves them, etc. And he tells her to speak. He wants to know, where can we find more treasure like this thing? She's silent. And she mentions, you know, or he mentions to her, last time we saw you, you were in the company of a certain pig keeper. Okay. In the bottom of 163, when Dorath grips her face, he says, this beardless boy... And then realizes, this isn't a boy at all. This is a witch. And she says, no, I'm not. And, you know, Ilanri princess, blah, 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 blah. Why is this significant? Well, once Dorath realizes, not a boy, a young woman, he thinks the way most men think. He says, you'll go free, page 164, right in the middle. You'll go free after a time, my pretty princess, after a time. When you, should, when you shall be fitting company for pig keepers, perhaps you may join the swine herd again. Perhaps he will even recognize your charms, whatever may be left of them. Have you considered what will be left of you, she says, when Taryn finds you? Notice, she doesn't think before she says that. She just spouts it off. Until now, she kept her self-possession. That is, she was in control of herself, in control of her attitudes, her feelings and such. But she could sense the outlaw's thoughts behind his cold eyes, and for the first time, she was deeply afraid. She's thinking, I'm going to get raped. And not just once. There's Dorothy and there's all those men. And then again, there's probably Dorth and all his men. Lord Swineherd and I will finish our reckoning when the time comes. That's, you know, what he means. You will be fitting company for a swineherd. You'll be swine yourself by the time we're done with you. But your time is now. And he leans towards her. Gurgi threatens him. 
jumps into him, tries to bite him. But before Dorath can kill Gurgi, a shape springs out. Two shapes, actually. Two wolves. Why? Well, what happened after Terran met with Meduin? We saw Terran and Fluter and the others leave. And what does Meduin do? He sends out the animals. He sends out bears. He sends out wolves. He sends out flying creatures. Okay. So Ilanwi speaks to the wolves, 166, and she realizes they understand her. She says, wait, there, there were two wolves. Okay, so if if you are the two wolves Medwin sent, you know, and she talks to them and she kind of gives them an idea. Bottom of 166, we're told, she looks at Gurgi in amazement. It's not words at all. It's like listening without your ears or hearing without your heart. Excuse me, hearing with your heart. I know it, but I can't imagine how I do. Well, what did Taliesin tell her? And yet, that's what Taliesin told me. That is, she has a knowledge that isn't gained from experience or from learning. It's something she just knows deep inside. Why? She's an enchantress. Okay. So, the wolves go along with them and pick up later in the chapter, last page or so. She sees them going into the cavern. Okay. And then she sees the huntsman. Bottom of page 170. So, Taryn and his troops go into the cavern. She sees the huntsmen. The huntsmen are coming up behind, not immediately. And then Taryn and his troops come back out of the cavern. Why? Because the cave in, they can't go all the way through. And she realizes Taryn and his troops are going to get wiped out. And she cries out, no. From her vantage point, bottom of 170, top of 171, the girl can span the valley. That is, she can see the entire valley. And it was suddenly coldly clear to her that the Comet Warriors and the Huntsmen, as yet unseen by one another, were moving closer together. There's going to be a great clash. They'll be trapped. And she cries out Terran's name. The echoes, were told, died in the vast, snowy expanse. It doesn't do any good. Darkness had fallen now over the valley, so they're going to literally kind of run into each other. And what happens? She felt as though her hands were tied and her voice stifled. That is, she felt useless. She felt powerless. Still calling Taryn's name, she snatches the bauble from her cloak. She lifts the sphere high. Why? She doesn't know. She's not lifting this to perform a magical act. She's, this is just innate knowledge acting through her. Brighter and brighter it glowed. The wolves turned away. Fearfully, Gurgi threw his arms over his face. The beams spread, rose toward the clouds, as though the sun itself were bursting from the mountainside. Notice, why is the light coming out? Is it because she lifts it up? Louder? Keep going. Who's she thinking of? Karen. She's not thinking of herself. What makes the bobble light up back in the second book, excuse me, third book, Castle of Lear, when they're stuck in the cave with glue? They think of others. Okay? And the whole valley had turned bright as noon. Well, go back to that page 31. Quenched will be Durnwind's flame, vanished its power, night turned to noon. There's the first part of the prophecy. Okay? So now we have two others. Rivers burn with frozen fire before Durnwin be regained. So, night's turn to noon. Next chapter, River of Ice. So, Terran and the others get rescued. They're all back together, happy and such. But, it's colder than hell. There's snow all around. 
they're freezing. They get to the top of the mountains because they're still trying to cut off the huntsmen. And we're told, page 176, they reach the summit. By this time, they'd reached the summit and come to the rim of an ice-bound lake. Now, it's not simply a lake. It's a lake with an outlet. But the outlet is frozen solid. At the sheer drop over the edge of the bluff, a frozen waterfall glittered under the moon. Like fingers on a huge fish, vast icicles clawed at the steep slope, etc., etc. Okay? So, Taryn realizes, who's down below? The huntsman. If we could break this waterfall, the huntsman will be destroyed. All right? Or Dolly realizes that. Free the lake, free the waterfall. Let it go pouring down. Okay? Taryn, how? How? Melt it. Cut branches, bushes, everything that will burn. Okay, so they try, and they get the fire going, the ice melts just enough to start cracking, the water rushes down, and the huntsmen are, are not destroyed, but at least slowed down, okay. Ilan, we and Gurgi show back up, and we're told, top of 180. Ilanwi says, Good old Dolly, it looked like a river of burning ice. There's the second part of the prophecy. Okay. She said, Don't you realize what you've done? Fluter, yeah. Rid ourselves of huntsmen. She goes, No, 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 no. The prophecy. Night turned to noon, rivers burned with frozen fire. Notice, she doesn't think of what she did. Okay. So, Taryn explains what she did. So now, those two aspects of the prophecy have been fulfilled. Why is that important? Because now, what's the last part? Durnwin will be regained. Those two things have to happen before Durnwin will be regained. Taryn, middle of 180, excuse me, 181. I do not understand the meaning of the prophecy myself. Are these signs of hope, or do we deceive ourselves, deceive ourselves by wishing them to be? Only Dalbin or Gwydion has wisdom to interpret them. And yet I can't help feeling there is some hope at last. But our task is no easier. Dolly, it's not impossible. Excuse me. No easier? It's impossible. Do you still mean to gain the Red Fallows? I warn you, the cauldron born are far out of reach. Don't talk to me about prophecies. In other words, if you try to go back through the red fallows, you'll never catch them. Okay? So, there's one way you can go. you got to take the mountains. Chapter 16. We leave Taryn and his company, and we go back to Kirdalvin. Why? Because Pradari attempts to get what from Dalvin? He wants to get the Book of Three. He tries touching it, and he's torched. We're going to skip that part. Pick up with Chapter 17, The Snowstorm. Okay. What's the problem with going over the mountains to Anuvan? Or, to put it more particularly, what's the problem for a certain individual? Who can't go close to a new one? Dolan. Okay? It's off, off limits, so to speak. So, Dolly says, tie me to the saddle, page 193, because he can't keep walking. Okay? And then he says, leave me here. You can't spare fluter, etc., etc. But they won't. They keep going. Um, we're going to skip a bunch. Kaw shows up. He tells them that Akron is nearby. Um, 
and pick up with pages 200, 201. They find Ocran, and she's nearly dead. Okay, 200. Terrence says she will not have strength to stand to stand such cold. That is the cold that they're experiencing in the mountains. Fluter, will any of us? Without a fire, we might as well just we might just as well say farewell to each other right now. Okay. Ilanwi's comfortable. We're told. Taryn looks at her. The girl did not stir under her cloak. Her eyes are half shut. Her voice faltered with drowsiness. Why does she say, I don't know what you're complaining about? Why is Taryn concerned? She's freezing to death, literally. Jack London wrote a great short story that deals with this, this very aspect. It's called To Build a Fire. It's set in the Klondike during the, the Alaskan Gold Rush, and it's about two guys who separate to go back to their cabin. They're off at their, their stake, and they want to go back to their cabin, and the one guy says, I'm going to take the shortcut. I'll meet you there. Okay, and he goes off, heavy snowfall, and he slips down a, a snowy hillside and crushes through the ice of a stream and gets soaked head to toe. Okay, he gets out of the ice and he's freezing and he's shivering, and thus we get the title of the short story, To Build a Fire. He knows, I don't build a fire soon, I'm a dead man. Okay. So he strips off his clothing, he gets some wood, and he tries to build a fire. Meanwhile, his dog is watching this. Okay. And the guy gets a fire built, base of a tree, he gets a fire built, and he's starting to warm his hands up because his hands have frozen. The rest of his body's nearly frozen. And he, I mean, he's kind of starting to come back to life. But the heat... Heats the air that melts the snow on the bow up above. It puts the fire out. I won't tell you the rest of the story. Look it up and, and read it. She's dying. Okay? When you die of cold, you don't, you know, sit there and just chatter and chatter and chatter. After a while, your body shuts down and the shivering stops. Why? Because your feet are essentially already dead. And it just slowly creeps up. And you just fall asleep. It's not painful. I mean, the pain goes away after a while. That's what Taryn's concerned about. Okay? So, you know, shakes her to wake her up because he doesn't want her to fall asleep because that's a... So, Taryn says, we have to build a fire. Dolly, yeah, with what? Fluter, page 201, reaches behind him and unslung his harp. And Dolly's like, harp music? Really? It shall give us the tune we need. Taryn, what are you, what are you thinking of, fluter? For a long moment, he held the harp lovingly in his hands, gently tucked the strings, then with a quick motion, raised the beautiful instrument and smashed it across his knee. Burn it. It is wood well seasoned. Terrence seizes the bard by the shoulders. What have you done? Gallant foolish flam. You've destroyed your heart for the sake of a moment's worth. Worth, warmth, we need a greater fire than this wood can ever give us. Okay? Dolly strikes a spark. Ilan, we kind of wakes up. Fluter. The truth of the matter, page 202, is that I'm delighted to be rid of it. I could never really play the thing. It was more a burden than anything else. Great Berlin, I feel light as a feather without it. Believe me, I was never meant to be a bard in the first place. So all is for the best. And notice, strings are splitting. Okay. The flames are now spread to all the fragments, and as the harp strings blazed, the melody sprang suddenly from the heart of the fire. Louder and more beautiful it grew. The strains of music filled the air, echoing endlessly among the crags. Dying, the harp seemed to be pouring forth all the songs ever played on it. And notice, all night the harp sang. Why? Because all night the harp burns. 
This isn't a big, magnificent, you know, Celtic floor harp. It's a little harp that he carries around his shoulder. It should burn, because it is well-seasoned wood, it should burn quickly, 20 minutes, 30 minutes max, and be gone. Instead, all night long. Then little by little, new life and strength return to the companions. Why? Because the harp is singing life into them. Only at dawn did the flames sink into glowing embers and the harp fall silent. And what does Fluter pick out of the flame? In the heat of the fire, the harp string had twisted and coiled around itself, but it glittered like pure gold. The string that Gwydion had given Fluter, that he said, this string will never break. Okay? Mount Dragon. So, Ocran is now revived. And she says, you think you can succeed where I failed? Page 205. She says, Mag and his warriors, they left me for dead. I lay in the forest like a wounded beast, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And she tells them, you want to defeat Iran? Of all the peaks surrounding Anuvan, top of the uh, middle of the next page, Mount Dragon alone can be breached. She says, and I'm the only one who knows the way through them. Okay. In your heart you fear me, pig keeper, but which do you fear the more? The path I offer you on the certain or the certain death of Lord Gwydion? There's two things to fear. <laughs> the path I'm offering you, or if you don't take it, Gwydion dies. Do you seek to overtake Iran's cauldron warriors? You cannot do unless you follow where I lead. Has Akron given them cause to believe her? Has she lied to them? This is my gift to you, pig keeper. Scorn it if you choose. Okay. Dolly says, I can't tell you whether or not she's telling the truth. But I've seen mounds that look sheer on one side and, other, and on the other. You could roll down with so much as a bump. She could be telling the truth. Fluter. And she could be trying to get rid of us the fastest way she knows. can't tell you either, Taryn. In other words, you're the leader, you decide. Taryn was silent for a moment, bottom of 207, searching for the wisdom to choose one way or the other, and again felt the weight of the burden Gwydion had placed upon him. He could read, he could not read Ocran's heart in her face. More than, more than once, the queen would have taken the lies of the companions, but... She had served Alban well and faithfully after her own powers had been shattered. The more than once the queen would have taken the lives of the companions? When is that? That's before she shows up at Dalvin's house. That's book one, book two. Okay? Terrence says, I don't think we can do any less than trust her until she gives us clear reason to doubt. Okay? So, she says, I know the path over. Why? Because I was the one who showed Iran that path all those years ago. So, they start to make their way. And Kaw shows up. And he cries out, Gwydion, Gwydion, Nuvin." Haste, in other words, hurry. So, Taryn runs. He beats everybody else to the top of Mount Dragon, and we're told, Taryn leaped from the ridge to join the companions. The shelf of stone crumbled at his feet. Okay. He pitched forward, Ilanwi scream rang in his ears, and the sharp rocks seemed to whirl upward against him. Desperately, he clutched at them, strove to break his fall with all his strength. He clung to the sheer side of Mount Dragon, while jagged stones bit like teeth into his palms. His sword ripped from his belt, clattered into the gorge. His foot slipped. He twisted. 
He's falling, and the Gethain speeding towards him. What's he thinking? Yeah, I'm food for the... The only problem is, when the Gethain gets close to him, he recognizes an old scar. This is the very same Gethain Terran rescued, book one. Okay? So, it, picture, it picks up Terran, sets him on the top of Mount Dragon. And we're told, Ocran had spoken the truth, page 212. Terran sees the way down. Okay? He sees the cauldron born. The Gwethaint utters a war cry because here come more Gwethaints, etc. And there's a tall rock at the very top of the mountain, 213. And then Terran hears a sound coming from the rock. The stone shrieked and moaned as if with a human tongue because of the wind blowing through it. Here was his only weapon. He flung himself against the rock and wrestled against the unyielding bulk, struggling to uproot it. Why? Cauldron border coming up. He's pushing on the rock. He wants to use it to push over the edge to take out the cauldron born. And we're told the rock moves. He sees it. He sends it crashing down on his assailants. Okay. Terran grabs for stones. And we're told, grope for a handful of stones of loose earth at the bottom of two thirteen. Even a broken twig to fling in defiance of the cauldron warrior who strode closer, blade upraised. The socket from which the dragon's crest had been torn was lined with flat stones, and in it, there's a sword. Pulls it up. He doesn't recognize the blade. And we're told, seeing no more than a weapon come to his hand, he ripped the sword from its seat. Durnwin, we're told, so we're told this is Durnwin, flamed with a white and blinding light. <laughs> and then he remembers. And he's struck because he's still alive. What happened the last time Terran did something like this? Tried to pull Durnwin from its sheath. Blazing light, he was blasted backwards. You know, Gwydion said, don't do that. <laughs> Cauldronborn stumbles and fall. And what happens? They all fall. All the cauldron warriors topple as one body. Terran rushes across the courtyard. He sees Gwydion, 215. Gwydion tells him, sheet the blade. He asks, how have you drawn this blade, pig keeper? My hands alone, dare touch it. Give me the sword. What should be the dead giveaway? Called him pig keeper. Quickly. And then Taryn realizes. Aron. Well, how can Gwydion, how, how can Aron look like Gwydion? How did the novel begin? He made himself look like whom? He made himself look like Terran to Gwydion and Fluter. Okay? That's when he stole Durnlin. What did I always say? So he couldn't have gotten past me. I would have known if it was you or not, you know, and such. So Terran strikes Aron and kills him. Uh, let's see here. There's Meg. We're going to skip Meg. <clears throat> um, Terrence says, don't strike Meg. Let Gwydion take care of him. Meg puts on the crown and it's killed because it's poisoned. Okay. Um, skip a bit. They go into the treasure hall, 219, of Aran. Gurgi does, and Glue does. Gurgi says, no, I'm not going to let you take anything from there. And let's see here. Taryn offers, bottom of 220 and 220, top of 221, Taryn offers Derwin back to Gwydion. Gwydion shakes his head. You've earned the right to draw it, and thus the right to wear it. 
Well, I thought you had to be of noble birth to draw it. Okay. They talk about the cauldron board, and Terence says, I hate them no longer. It was not their wish to bend in slavery to another's will. Now they are at peace. Okay. But then he says, but the prophecy, it doesn't make sense. I didn't hear any stone speaking. A fluter says that. Tarek, I have. There was a voice on Mount Dragon. Yes, fluter, the voiceless, bo voiceless stone spoke clearly. All right. And Arlandwi says, I suppose so if you think about it in that way. As for Derwin's flame being quenched, Hen was quite mistaken. So, let's see here. 2.22. Um, Ocran brings Ter brings sorry um, Iran to Terran. Terran sprang aside uh, this top of the page. Terran when flashed from its scabbard, Ocran had clutched the serpent in both hands as though to strangle or tear it asunder. The head of snake darted toward her. The scaly body lashed like a whip. Fang sank, sank deep in Ocran's throat. With a cry, she falls back, tries to do it again. Terran swings. And the snake is split in two. Terran drops to his knees beside Gwydion, who holds the limp body of the queen. And she says to Gwydion, Have I not kept my oath? Is the lord of Anubin slain? It is good my death comes easily upon me. And she dies. Why is it significant that she dies in Gwydion's arms? Okay, she's redeemed. What else? What did she offer Gwydion? To be her king. That is, she would be his queen he, if he would be her king. Why? Is it merely a power trip? What does it usually symbolize when a woman or a man when a woman dies in a man's arms or when a man dies in a woman's arms, what's usually going on there? Yeah. There was, there was a relationship there. Now, never in the novels are we told that there is a relationship, a love, a romantic relationship between Gwydion and Ocran. But it's implied that there is that on Ocran's side toward Gwydion. So this is, as Bill put it, this is kind of her redemption. Okay. So we see the sword, and what are we told? Page 223. Now that Iran has been killed, Ilan, we, you know, screams and says, look at the sword. Or Fluter says, look at the sword. And Terran takes up the blade, but even as he grasped the hilt, the flame of Durnwin flickered as though stirred by wind. The white brilliance dimmed like a dying fire, faster than the glow faded. Faded, no longer white, but filled with swirling colors. And in a no moment more, Terran's hand held no more than a scarred and battered weapon whose blade glinted dully. Why? It's done what it was made for. Now it's merely what? An old battered sword. There's no magic to it anymore. Okay? Alon we pulls out the bobble. And they read the inscription again. She says, now I can read the part that was scratched out. Draw, Dernwin, bottom of 223, only thou of noble worth to rule with justice, to strike down evil. Who wields it in good cause shall slay even the Lord of Death. And in another moment, the inscription is gone. Never to be read again. Okay? So, the next chapter. What are we told? They go back to Dalbin's. Bottom of 227. Where are 
Gwydion and Dalbin headed to summer lands. The Sons of Dawn, bottom of 227, Gwydion says, Their kinsmen and kinswomen must board the golden ships and set sail for the summer country, the land from which we came. Terence says, what? How? I mean, why? Must you sail now to what purpose? How soon shall you return? Shall you not first rejoice in your victory? What's Terran thinking? Prince Gwydion. Math is dead. Prince becomes king. Gwydion. Our victory is itself the reason for our voyage. When the Lord of Anuvin shall be overcome, then must the sons of Don depart forever from Perdae. In other words, the only reason we came here in the first place was because of Aron. Now that he's gone, our job is done. Okay. Arlan was like, no, not now. Of all, what, what does she mean, of all times? She's looking a little bit forward. Like, there's going to be a wedding. We cannot turn from this ancient destiny. Fluter must join too. Why? He's kin. He's a cousin. Fluter's like, I don't think I want to. <laughs> he doesn't have a choice notice. Taliesin says, It's not for you to choose, son of Godo, but know that the summer country is a fair land, fairer even than Pradane, and where all, one where all heart's desires are granted. What is the summer country? paradise. Notice, it's the place where all your desires are fulfilled. It's the place where there is no sighing, no sorrowing, no weeping, etc. And it's the summer country. There's no fall. There's no winter. It's always green. Okay. He says, Taliesin goes on, and you're going to have a new harp, Fluter, and guess what? I'm going to teach you how to play it. Every time Fluter says, you know, I didn't really want to be a bard. What did he really mean? I really want to be a bard. But, like Terran and Pottery, just didn't have the knack. In the summer country, because all desires are fulfilled, he will become a bard. And he will become the greatest bard he can be. Your heart has always been the heart of a true bard, Fluter. Until now, it was unready. Have you not given up that which you love most for the sake of your companions? In other words, he had to destroy his harp so that he could come into true possession of the real harp. Okay? He goes on, Taliesin does. All men born must die, save those who dwell in the summer country. There's no death. It is a land without strife or suffering, suffering where even death itself is unknown. So, Gwydion will never die. Fluter will never die. Taliesin will never die. Okay? Dalvin says, I gotta leave too, and so will come an end to everything related to my powers. Okay? All enchantments will pass away. Dooley! will return to the realm of the fair folk. And what's going to happen to the fair folk? They're going to stay underground. Okay. So what's going to happen to Perdain now that Iran has been destroyed? All the really cool stuff leaves. Magic is gone. Enchantment is gone. The fairy people, the fair folk, are gone. Okay. Hinwin can go. Gurgi can go. Ilanwi can go to the fair country. Why? She's an enchantress. Terran can go. Terran says, wait, you mean Ilanwi and I will never be separated again? We'll be married, and, and she says, of course I'll marry you. Right? So, 
they keep talking and Terrence goes to sleep that night. It's the night before, they're all getting ready to go and he has a vision or a dream or an experience. And what does he see? The three enchantresses, Ordu, Orwin, and Orgok. Wrinkled old, shriveled up apple faces with fat, dumpy bodies? No, swimsuit models. I mean, drop dead gorgeous. And they say some things to him. And Taryn asks, why have you come? Do you two journey to the summer country? And they say, we're journeying, but not with you, etc., etc." And they come and bring him something. And they show him this tapestry. Taryn says, I've seen this. Why do you offer it to me? I don't ask for it, nor can I pay for it. 234. It is yours by right. Why? He wove it. What's the tapestry? His life. His experiences. And notice, when he first saw that tapestry, what did it look like? Unfinished. Unfinished, a jumble of images. It didn't make any sense. Now, it's beautiful. It's glorious. Puzzled, Taryn looks more closely. And in it, he sees what? Crowded with images of men and women, warriors, battles, birds, and animals. This is my own life. Of course. The pattern is of your choosing. Always was. My choosing? I thought, and now he understands. <coughs> I thought the world once did your bidding. In other words, that they were the three, what? Fates. Right? They're not. There is no fate. Fate is what? As Ann Law says about the pot, it's what you make of it. Okay? So, the next morning, Taryn says, I can't accept your gift. The gift of the summer country. Ilan was getting, you know, she's just ready to smack him up. What do you mean? Taryn says, I can't go. Yes, I love you. I will love you always. Dobbin says, make sure. And Taryn says, 237. I'm going to keep you a minute or two late, probably. There are more, there are those more deserving of your gift than I. Because keep in mind, what does his gift involve? Or involve? Unending life. Unending blessedness. Well, who are those who are more deserving? Call. Son of Kalfruer. Rune. So, why does Terrence stay? Who's going to plant Kal's garden? Who's going to build Rune's seawall? What, what's his point? Who's going to care for Pradane if we all leave? Terrence says, Shall I forget Anlaw Clay Shaper, Comet Marin, and others like it? I cannot restore life to Lanio, son of Lanwin, and those valiant folk, nor can I mend the hearts of widows and orphan children. Yet if it is in my power to rebuild even a little of what has been broken, this must I do. I can't bring them back to life, but I can do what? I can, one, make sure they're not forgotten, and two, I can try to fix what is broken now. The Red Fallows once were a fruitful place, with labors they shall be so again. He's saying, maybe I can try to make Pridane a little bit of the summer country. Maybe I can bring a little bit of the blessings of the summer country here. Okay. Gurgi says, I'll stay. Ilanwi says, you've chosen as you must. Dobbin says, I won't disagree, you know, but you're going to have a hard time. We'll stop there. We'll spend about, I don't know, a couple minutes on um, Wednesday with the very end of this before we get into Sabriel. And we'll have a quiz.
over this.